and especially uh, the Dean of Faculty of Social Sciences, Professor Sanjay Chaturvedi, who's also right here as one of the speakers today, uh, Vice President Professor Shashank Pereira, and of course our uh, SAU's President, uh, Dr. Kavita Sharma, for also helping facilitating and encouraging this event. Uh, of course, I also wish to thank Professor Lisa Boudin for coming all the way uh, from Chicago to Delhi to participate in today's event and to participate in two more events uh, she has scheduled at the South Asian University. Uh, this event actually is part of a series of three events and it is perhaps the first, it is the first collaboration between the Faculty of Social Sciences and the University of Chicago uh, India Center. Uh, let me try and situate today's event very briefly and very quickly as well. Area studies constitutes an important component of social sciences, humanities, and policy. As someone trained in, in social anthropology, uh, for example, uh, I was often identified first and foremost as a South Asianist, and later, of course, one specified which kind of anthropology one was interested in. Area studies has actually a long and complex history, of course, in the West. And yet, one could also point to other sort of perspectives and periods, uh, such as, uh, and I'm thinking of the medieval Mid uh, Middle East and looking at writers like Ibn Khaldun or Ibn Battuta, or even Chinese travelers' accounts as offering alt their own perspectives on what now we can consider area studies. In recent years, the conversation has begun in our part of the world in different forms, of which scholars like Professor Chaturvedi here, of course, has been uh, extremely uh, involved. Very recently, of course, a volume edited by Professor Shashank Pereira, Dr. Ravi Kumar, and Dr. Patak of the South Asian University uh, are also now addressing ed area studies in the context of uh, the disciplines of sociology and social anthropology, in, and uh, very critically looking at uh, South Asian studies from South Asia as opposed to just of South Asia. Hence, we're seeing, of course, new possibilities uh, of what a conversation on area studies may involve from two different continental perspectives. And uh, it is this, uh, we welcome you all to a panel discussion on the question, do area studies matter? Uh, let me first introduce our uh, panelists of the day. Uh, professor Lisa Wedin is a Mary R. Morton Professor of Political Science and the, co and the co and, uh, co director of the Chicago Center for Contemporary Theory at the University of Chicago. She's also Associate Faculty in Anthropology and co-editor of the University of Chicago book series, Studies and Practices of Meaning. Her publications include two books, Ambiguities of Domination, Politics, Rhetoric, and Symbols in Contemporary Syria, and Peripheral Visions, Publics, Power, and Performance in Yemen. Um, she is the recipient of the David Collier Mid-Career Achievement Award and an NSF Fellowship. Her third book, Authoritarian Apprehensions, Ideology, Judgment, and Mourning in Syria is forthcoming in 2019 from the University of Chicago Press. And she's also working on an edited volume with Joseph Masco entitled Conspiracy Struck Theory. Professor Sanjay Chaturvedi is the Chairperson, Department of International Relations and Dean Faculty of Social Sciences, South Asian University, New Delhi. And he specializes in the theory and practices of geopolitics with references to polar regions and the Indian Ocean region. He has been a member of the Steering Committee of International Geographical Union, Commission on Political Geography, and the co-chair of Research uh, Committee 15 on Political and Cultural Geography of the International Political Science Association. He is the co-editor of the Journal of Indian Ocean Region and regional editor of the Polar Journal. Professor Chaturvedi serves on the editorial advisory board on five, six uh, on, uh, peer review journals. His recent publications include Climate Terror, A Critical Geo Geopolitics of Climate Change, which he has authored with uh, Timothy Doyle, and Climate Change in the Bay of Bengal, Emerging Geographies of Hope and, uh, Hope and Fear. Recently, he has been selected and invited as lead author for Chapter 10 Asia of the Working Group Contribution to the IPCC Sixth Assessment Report. Welcome to the both of you, and thank you for joining us. Um, what we are going to do is I'm going to try and uh, pose a question to our uh, two panelists today. And uh, I will pose the question to each of our panelists, and then we can proceed from there. So uh, I'd like to begin first with Professor Vadid, if I may invite her to speak and uh, respond to one question we can begin with. And uh, the question I want to pose to, of course, both of you is, what do you think is the value of area studies for the social sciences or humanities? And uh, do you discern any particular moment or moments where the value of area studies is sort of changing? Um, so first of all, thank you very much for having me here. It's a delight to be back in Delhi. It's one of my favorite places on Earth. So. I'm very 
very happy. It's a privilege, privilege and an honor to be here with you both today and with this wonderful audience. Um, I wanted to start by thinking about the latter part of your question and, Ankur, and to, to think a little bit about periodizing area studies. So uh, the emergence of area studies programs in the United States, the place I know best, uh, corresponded with the consolidation of American social science between the 1930s and the 1950s. And by the 1950s, these programs had become tethered to American national security initiatives and were a symptom of Cold War anxieties. In part, area studies in the United States was a response to the Soviet Union's 1957 launch of the satellite Sputnik. Congress was prompted to pass the National Defense Education Act of 1958, the first large-scale government funding package for higher education in the United States. With the aim of cultivating knowledge about areas judged crucial for United States national security, Title VI of that law secured funding for university-based area study centers and for graduate student fellows. Among the foreign languages deemed necessary for safeguarding national security were ones spoken in the Middle East, the area of which I have the most expertise. That is to say, languages like Arabic, Turkish, and Persian. And I believe Hindi and Urdu were included uh, at the beginning of this initiative. Much has been written about Title VI and about foundation funding as well, especially foundation funding from Ford, Rockefeller, Social Science Research Council, and Carnegie. My goal isn't here in the few minutes I have to talk to rehearse those arguments, but simply to note that by the late 1960s, this massive infusion of funds contributed to an increase in the number of PhDs being awarded to students of area studies. By the 1970s, however, area knowledge had come increasingly under attack. Growing disaffection coincided with various transformations in area studies programs themselves, in notions of what counted as a scientific enterprise, and in the relationship of politics and political science, my discipline, to both of these matters. Now, initially, according to the theorist, uh, uh, po uh, the political theorist, Timothy Mitchell, area studies was seen as a supplement to social science, a supplement that would, quote, make it whole, unquote. Social science knowledge aimed at expressing universal truths, and area studies would be part of that project, revealing through research in non-Western regions any provincialism. The professionalization of area studies achieved by the mid-1960s coincided with the growing sense of the project's problems and made it vulnerable to challenges from all sides. The radicalization of politics within and outside of the academy in the late 60s and early 70s, the circulation of so-called third world scholars and ideas, the dynamics of exile, and stated visions of a moral political future independent of former colonial powers helped to spotlight area studies complicity with colonial and post-colonial forms of domination. So the positivistic po social sciences, themselves vulnerable to the political crises of the 1960s and the economic ones of the 1970s, also increasingly raised doubts about area studies' ability to contribute to universal knowledge. The presidential address at the annual convention of the Middle East Studies Association in 74, delivered by the political scientist and scholar Leonard Binder, registered area studies move to the defensive. 
Binders addressed a firm social sciences commitments to objectivity and depicted areas as the raw material for testing and confirming scientific hypotheses or for discovering important variations. In this view, areas were filled with facts and regions could be treated as if they were objects to be apprehended by ostensive definition rather than as concepts and imaginaries constituted at least in part by the analyst. That was one end of an area studies challenge or attack. Binder's defense of area studies responded primarily to the concerns of positivist social science. But it was Said's Orientalism that offered a particularly influential critique of the area studies project, challenging both Binder's objectivist recuperation and the idea of a universal science <coughs> more generally. Said explicitly took up Binder's presidential address to point out that things that exist are to some extent constituted by the knower. Said also argued that the relationship between modernity and imperialism was one of co-formation and co-implication. He therefore placed an analysis of empire at the heart of studying the modern, and invited scholars to shift attention away from the Orient to the ways in which it had been studied and constructed. So Said's intervention was both a product of an increasing turn towards epistemological reflexivity in the social sciences and generative of further developments. His specific commitments to the Middle East helped to transform how that region in particular was viewed as an object of study and as an area vulnerable to great power intervention. So by the late 1980s and early 1990s, with these intellectual moves afoot and the Cold War coming to an end, area studies lost some of its luster no longer beholden to Cold War national security concerns and under fire from anti-colonial scholars whose attunements to the power knowledge nexus marked an important shift. In other words, area studies has been made vulnerable to charges both of insufficient scientific rigor and relevance from positivists in the social science tradition while being criticized as Orientalist by post-colonial theories. It has been attacked by both sides. So one of the invitations tonight is to think, how much do we want to recuperate area studies? How do we bear the brunt of those challenges to it that basically animated at least the American Academy in the 1990s? Thank you so much, Lisa. And uh, some really interesting ideas that are sort of coming up, and also a revisiting of some of the earlier kind of history uh, of which area studies uh, sort of emerged in the North American University. Um, I will now turn to Professor Chaturvedi, and if I can pose the same question to you as well. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Tatta. Uh, what a privilege and honor it is for me to be here this uh, evening. Very grateful for this invitation and the opportunity of sharing the dais with uh, Professor Vadeen, whose work I have read and admired for a long time. And I'm very grateful also to uh, Aditi Modi, this wonderful Chicago center of yours, my first visit. Um, and um, I'm absolutely delighted um, and privileged. The question uh, that um, that Dr. Datta has posed, uh, I think it's a very uh, intriguing question uh, because as a student of scholar of geopolitics and particularly both classical versions of geopolitics and critical uh, geopolitics, I'm deeply interested in the politics behind the production of geographical knowledges and how they frame spaces and places. Uh, the first question that comes to my mind is um, rather sort of naive kind of a question, which is that what is area? Uh, 
why, why do we use the term area studies? Uh, why not uh, the study of a region or a sub-region or the study of a continent? And I think the answer came quite explicitly from Professor Bettine's very insightful statement that uh, area studies are historically contingent in the sense that there are, there are various traditions, diversity of traditions in which these narratives of area studies could be located. And one dominant tradition, geopolitical tradition, is the Western geopolitical tradition. Uh, and uh, I would <coughs> even go back to that particular moment in history, and I think this point has some bearing on our contemporary conversations on area studies where American critical geographer John Agnew reminds us that it all began with the modern geographical imagination, which of course <coughs> led to the colonial imperial projects uh, of all kinds. And he reminds us that the very first epoch of geopolitics was that of what he calls civilizational geopolitics. And he draws our attention to one of the greatest, what he calls the conceits in geography, where we look at Europe and Asia as two continents. And he reminds us that the boundary between Europe and Asia was in fact a cultural boundary. So I think the question of boundaries and identities also lies at the core of what we call area studies. And of course, the origins, uh, as, you, as you pointed out, uh, Professor Bettin, uh, that particular moment uh, in history fast forward from what I was talking about when the US uh, strategic interests, the, in the context of uh, the Cold War ideological geopolitics, uh, identified those areas, I'm using this word quote unquote, on the face of the globe, uh, which were considered as strategic to United States foreign policy, defense policy objectives. And here comes, I think, uh, something very interesting that, um, and I think that draws our attention to two sets of considerations. One, of course, is the politics of knowledge. Uh, and also the way in which the discipline of international relations evolves through all kinds of divorces, particularly divorce from political theory and comparative politics, and the way it interfaces then with uh, international relations. And the second is more conceptual, theoretical kind of interest in three notions. One is space, the second is scale, and the third is knowledge power. Mm -hmm. When knowledge powers and uh, Dr. Dutta's question, the second question is also it's interesting that can we identify certain moments in history when we start rethinking, revisiting this question of area studies? And I think one uh, such moment uh, is the moment of interregnum when we see a number of transitions and transformations taking place where power shifts. And I think. Going back 500 years ago, John Hobson's classic work on, on, on the, what he calls the East as the cradle of globalization, that probably was one moment. And fast forward, we look at the post-Second World War, and now we look at another moment of interregnum. When power shifts, but correspondingly, we do not see shift in ideas. I mean, the point which Professor Amitabh Acharya in his quest for non-Western international relations has also pointed out that these are the moments when we see a great deal of cartographic anxiety in the air, when we see that there's a lot of disorientation on the part of foreign policy establishments and defense uh, uh, establishments. So the question then again comes to my mind is that, of course, when we are talking about area studies and we are looking at this politics of knowledge, one thing is very clear to me, and that is that locations matter. Even today, despite globalization, and perhaps because of globalization, locations have become extremely uh, important. And if you look at the labels that were, that were being given to these areas, you also see some very interesting shifts. 
Of course, those shifts have taken us to something which probably we'll discuss a little later, which is the new cartographies and how, what kind of area studies are we going to talk about in the 21st century. But what is very interesting is that South Asia, Southeast Asia, these were the outcomes of the geopolitical partitioning of the globe that came from very hegemonic locations on the face of the globe. And interestingly, and perhaps rather intriguingly, we here in South Asia also have something called South Asian studies. Uh, of course, uh, when there was this narrative of Asian studies uh, in the United States, we knew that uh, at that particular moment, uh, or for a very long time, uh, the focus was far more on China uh, than on India. Now, in, uh, given our location at the South Asian University, we have become increasingly aware of the fact that when you become an object of area studies, and when you try to be a subject of area studies, it makes a huge difference. Because on the one hand, you become aware of the politics of reductionism. On the other hand, you become deeply interested in having more details in order to question the kind of labeling uh, that goes on. So I think area studies, if it can be, uh, it can be uh, a tool to dominate, differentiate, and perhaps even discriminate, then the urge for area studies can also acquire very different kind uh, of, of forms uh, and quests. So I remain uh, interested in the question of when we say, what is the value of area studies? Value to whom? You know, who is interested in area studies? For what kind of reasons? What kind of purposes? What are the agendas and what are the interests involved? Uh, thank you very much, Professor Chaturvedi, uh, for your intervention. And uh, especially about bringing the question of uh, power and knowledge, which is also coming up in uh, Professor Wadeen's point uh, as well. Um, I was wondering then if we could just um, move to another question, but also I, I'm interested in keeping in mind also to some extent the contingent history of area studies, um, clearly both uh, sort of in the West and in North America, and also what we're seeing emerging now in the context, of course, uh, South Asia, or perhaps one could say of even in India, uh, in that sense. Um, for me personally, I've often felt at one level a kind of, uh, as as I mentioned earlier, I, sort of I came from anthropology and uh, I studied in a department where you identified yourself as uh, what your area of studies was. As students, uh, when we organized our own seminar uh, sessions, it would be the South Asia seminar versus the Africa seminar uh, versus the Middle East seminar, which a friend of mine then renamed as uh, SWANA, the Southwest Asia North Africa seminar because that's more accurate. And the Africa seminar then broke into South and East and Central Africa. Um, and in, South Asia, in the South Asia seminar, we were constantly fighting among ourselves as to why were most of the papers on India. And you would sort of have one paper from Pakistan or Bangladesh as a token <coughs> uh, South Asian. Um, I was just wondering also, given its sort of history, and if I could just ask, is there now, at this moment, a kind of distinctive interest on what an area studies could be offer. Uh, if I may ask uh, uh, Professor Wadeen to comment this on in North American campuses right now, as one addresses it, whether one is doing it as a as a scholar in the various social sciences, whether it's a PhD student or whether student of policy, uh, or as someone uh, applying their discipline. So perhaps if I could ask Professor uh, Wadeen to talk about this from what is currently in the North American setting. And if I could ask Professor Chaturvedi to talk about it in the context of India or South Asia. Uh, and the reason why I'm asking this is because in some respects, we are also now aware, as the both of you pointed out, of the problematic history and its relationship to power. And yet, of course, we don't often see a change of ideas, in, at least in policy. So what do we see that's coming up, which can also provide perhaps a somewhat of an, an alternative reading? Uh, I could say this, for example. Um, in anthropology, there was always a sense that you also studied what was not modern, which then becomes you studied non-Western societies. 
But now when I look at a lot of work some friends of mine have done, say those who are British anthropologists studying in the UK, what is the radical moment is studying Britain. Or uh, some of the recent ethnographies I've read uh, among anthropologists are coming about studies of the United States. And in India, there's a sense now that most of us are often preoccupied with just studying India. So now we have to go out into the world. So I was wondering, I mean, this is just an example, but what could we look at as sort of a, the radical possibility right now from the two contrast perspectives? Uh, it's a great question. Um, and I do think that there are some heartening responses to it. Um, most of the fruitful understandings of the ways in which theories from the global south, for example, self-consciously inform and illuminate theory in the northern hemisphere are happening less through a reinvigoration of area studies per se, and more through a kind of radicalization of disciplines such as anthropology, history, literary studies, philosophy, maybe to some extent political theory, but certainly not political science, sadly enough. And that just reminds me of something you said, Professor Chaturvedi, uh, that um, the, uh, what counts as an area. So one of the most interesting things for me about my discipline of political science is that the United States is not understood as an area. It, it, it stands in for the general, right? So most of the kind of methodological innovations, the way in which it's treated, it is a kind of non-territorial territory. A very, very interesting and deeply depressing fact that continues to bedevil the discipline of political science. The people who have been trailblazers in what I'm thinking of as theories from the global south um, calling for a robust and reciprocal exchange, appreciative of ongoing power relations and keen to theorize them. These folks are people who have profound knowledge about and commitments to local places in the global south. And they tend to, to be people who have developed their scholarship uh, in vigorous sympathy with anti-colonial movements. The move to, say, provincialize Europe, to borrow Tepesh Chakrabarty's felicitous phrase, or the claim made by South African anthropologists Jean and John Komarov that the northern hemisphere is evolving toward the global south are theoretical moves that also speak to a profound political aspiration to undercut Western hegemony and to undo the kinds of problems that previously uh, were central to area studies itself. So two other points. There's been a cross-fertilization of ideas with scholars like Franz Fanon or Mahatma Gandhi inspiring theory and political activism in the Northern Hemisphere long before this term to theories of the global south. So this is not all new. Second, but the return to the global south and the innovations are salutary and profound in deploying the term the global south as a shorthand for the world of non-European post-colonial peoples. There's an effort to give up on the invidious distinctions that used to characterize worldviews captured in the phrase, the West and the rest. Whereas the Southern Hemisphere used to be coded, I can't need not remind you of this as backward, was made synonymous with underdevelopment, unorthodox economies, failed states and nations fraught with corruption and poverty. The Northern Hemisphere was that half that generated theories about and positioned the South as a problem in need of intervention. The turn in the 2000s is a call to see the global South as a source of theory and explanation for world historical events in its own right. As the Komarovs put it, quote, Many nation states of the Northern Hemisphere experience increasing fiscal meltdown, state privatization, 
corruption and ethnic conflict. It seems though they are evolving southward, so to speak, in both positive and problematic ways. Is this so? In what measure? What might this mean for the very dualism on which such global oppositions rest? These questions, I think, should be a source for further conversation here tonight and elsewhere. The Komarovs focused on Africa, but touched on a range of familiar themes, law, labor, and the contours of contemporary capitalism, in order to ask, how might we understand these matters with theory from what they call an eccentric vantage point? As they write, this view renders some key problems of our time at once strange and familiar, what I like to think of as a cultivating a politics of estrangement. In other words, it offers an ironic condemnation of liberal progress by compelling us to think about convergences, a shared global world in which corruption is rampant and ordinary citizens all over the place toggle between optimism and despondency. That's what I see this kind of turn towards the global south, not as an object of scrutiny or inquiry, but as a co-interlocutor in trying to build better, more capacious, more provocative theory for the future. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, Professor Chaturvedi, what do you have to say? Uh, firstly, I'm reminded of um, of the term territorial trap, uh, which again takes us to John Agnew's uh, very interesting argument that um, modern geographical imagination and its various forms continue to be in some kind of a territorial spatial trap, state-centric understandings of politics, political, society, social, even cultural. And the consequences are far-reaching in the sense that even when uh, the academic policy imagination takes you to the category called or the label called area, uh, there's not getting away, no significant getting away from uh, a very state-centric understanding of, of politics and political. The second is that uh, I fully agree that Today, when we talk about the crisis of area studies, especially in India, we are talking about, if not, if crisis might sound like a very strong word, but let us be reminded of the fact that uh, more recently uh, in India, a number of area study centers <coughs> have been closed down. Uh, let us also remind ourselves of the fact that um, in April 1963, UGC had set up a committee which was headed by one of its members, B. Shiva Rao, to suggest a scheme to promote area studies in Indian universities. And uh, the idea was, the purpose was that um, there would be these area studies centers which will engage in policy-oriented research because, again, as I said, that uh, locations matter and in that post-colonial, post-partition context, uh, India's uh, for foreign policy establishments also had a particular understanding of strategic geographies of India's <coughs> internal, external, India's foreign policy <coughs> engagements. And uh, the idea was to understand those regions with which India was going to engage. Uh, what, what surprises me um, a good deal is that when we started area studies programs uh, in India, we failed to be innovative in the sense that we were still using those names and those labels uh, 
through which India had been perceived, through which the Indian subcontinent had been perceived. We still uh, established Latin American studies, uh, we, which we had Central Asian studies. Uh, from one perspective, perhaps there's nothing wrong with it, but from a more critical uh, IR perspective, uh, one can see that at that particular moment, perhaps, we were not theory makers, we were still theory takers. We were map takers rather than map makers. Something was, was happening uh, at that particular uh, moment in time, in the post-colonial moment. Maybe cartographic anxiety, Shankar Krishna's uh, you know, well-known observation was also, uh, also at work. Uh, and today, again, you find something uh, very interesting um, happening here, which is that uh, the cartographies, the fixed geographies and the boundaries of these areas are changing and changing very fast. Uh, to give you one example, and see how area studies then, uh, particularly when you talk about policy relevant area studies, how they feed into and are fed by the mental maps of the foreign policy establishments. We were not talking about look east for a very long time. We were not. Our understanding of India's uh, eastern neighborhood did not travel very far because the Cold War mapping, the Cold War cartographies had become uh, so, so dominant. Today, we find, and I think that's a good awareness, good realization, and perhaps that also explains what I said, quote unquote, this crisis of area studies in India. I'm not, uh, I don't agree completely with Parag Khanna's connectography uh, book, but I think there is one point which he's making, which is a very interesting point, that you're not looking at fixed static status geographies in contemporary context. You are looking at functional geographies. You are looking at geographies of flows and, and mobility. So what you see today is a tension between a spatially defined area and an area which is defined in terms of challenges and issue areas, say for example. So if you look at Central Asia, for example, in terms of a fixed spatial imagination, geographical imagination, within this territorial trap, we are looking at a very different Central Asia. But if we are looking at Central Asia in terms of the functional geographies of India's quest for energy and energy security, you are on a very different page uh, altogether. Now, on Global South, my submission is that um, I think it is important to realize as we now imagine new area studies uh, in more contemporary context, that there is a very complex geography and history to Global South itself. Uh, I mean, Global South can be a very useful category to question all kinds of biases in international relations, both in theories uh, and practices. But Global South should not become um, a label or a category which then homogenizes a very diverse reality. It could be a site of emancipatory politics. It would be a site, a site of more critically informed international relations, moving away from state, uh, state centrism. So I think that, in my view, is a very, uh, a very important distinction. I have I continue to use the term Global South, even in my own work on climate uh, geopolitics, but being aware at the same time that perhaps there is something else that is going on uh, while questioning Orientalism, while questioning some of those racist geographies of international relations, it could well be that we are also internalizing some of those geographies within what we call today the Global South.